Today I have brought you three different games from the years 35, 54 and 85. Um, I'm sure we'll manage to go over two of them properly. And, uh, and the third one, I'm not sure, but like I did last time in the last lecture, if we don't have time to see the whole game properly, I will just mention the names, give you, um, encourage you to look for the game in the databases or online. You can see this game online, all those games online. And um, yeah, I think it's a worthy, uh, worthy lecture. Now, this is really funny because the first game I'm showing you, I've heard the name of it, and I haven't seen it in many years. I think the last time I saw it, I was not good enough to appreciate it. And uh, it's called The Pearl of Zandvoort. Zandvoort is, is a city in Holland, a town in Holland. And it was uh, where the match between Max Over and Alexander Alekhine, or Jochen, was played in 35. And it was called The Pearl of it because it was supposed to have been a really impressive game. And it is impressive in the sense that what, what you will see in it. Unfortunately, somehow, when you check it with some computer, like let's say um, Stockfish 6, my favorite, um, you will see that this is more like the garbage of Zandvoort. I mean, this is, uh, the game turns out to be really bad. There are so many mistakes for both sides. And it's like, and, and, and the commentary that's given in the chess base, mega base, it's like almost like a mirror, mirror opposite. Every time they give a question mark, it's an exclaim. Every time it's an exclaim, it's a question mark. Like everything is upside down. I don't understand that. So very discouraging for me. Nonetheless, the game is still worth looking over because even if a game is imperfect, something we're all very familiar with, even me, um, you can enjoy it. But let, let's try to respect the game because in, with hindsight, in, in Stock V6, everybody's a genius. In 1935, when you have to play for the World Championship match with so much at stake and all the nerves and tensions and the time control and the ticking clock, it's much harder. So Max Over is white, Alexander Aljochen is black. D4, E6. I always love seeing Aljochen games because he was many things, but opening expert, he definitely wasn't. And uh, he always tried to like, let's just get rid of this opening somehow, play a middle game, and then things got interesting. So he plays E6, God knows why. C4, F5, okay, so he wants to play the Dutch today. G3, Bishop B4, check. Okay, a move like this definitely needs some explaining. The point is that part of White's ideal setup would be to develop the knight, bishop, castle, then play b3, and again, depending on how black is gonna set his pieces, either put a bishop on b2, in the case that you will play bishop e7, d6, etc. Or if you play d5 and bishop d6, then I will wanna play bishop a3 to trade bishops so as to accentuate my control of the e5 square. So this move kind of forces something that white doesn't want to do. Because like also the knight wants to go to d2, and then when the knight from f3 jumps to e5, he wants to be able to do this. Also, he wants to be able to play e4. So now everything is kind of, if you play knight c3, you pin it. It's like a Nimzo Indian where I manage to get f5 in. That's obviously a plus. Or you have to play bishop d2 like in the game. Then I just retreat with my bishop and your bishop on d2 is a bit funny. So again, a little nuance, not exactly an amazing achievement. So bishop g2, knight f6. Knight c3, okay, the bishop is on d2, took away the place from the knight, and now the knight just comes here. Castles, very nice, knight f3, and now, very impatiently, Ayokin plays the move knight e4. Okay, already the commentator said that better was d5, but the computer says that knight e4 is no worse, but definitely the move knight e4 is kind of a, a little early, it just feels like, dude, what about the rest of your pieces? But didn't we learn, don't move the same piece twice? I know that you are a grandmaster and world champion, but still. Um, of course, after d5, d5 would make a lot of sense because this setup for white is not the most dangerous against it, obviously. Like we said, the bishop should be elsewhere, the knight should be elsewhere, but okay. He plays knight e4, and white can afford to castle. Normally, the bishop is not on d2, and then knight takes knight, breaking up the pawn structure could be really annoying. But with the bishop on d2, we don't have to worry about that. And white can afford to castle. And black plays the move b6. I should say, this is game 26 in their match. Two, two games ago, black played the move uh, bishop f6. And now he tries to improve with b6. But this is not an improvement, by the way. But not because of the next move. In, he played in the game queen c2. Uh, when you put this in stockfish 6 and let it churn for a little bit, he is a big proponent of knight takes here. He really, really likes knight takes here, pawn takes knight e5. 
looks a little counterintuitive because you think the knight's going to be chased to where. But listen, I'm about to take pawns and I'm about to attack rooks. And this is because if you play d5, my knight on e5 is super justified. So believe me, I'm not going to. There's no way I can analyze this game at length, or we, A, will not see any of the others, B, we'll never finish this one. We only have one, just under one hour for the lecture. But again, trust me when I promise you, takes, takes, 95 would have been very testing. So, queen c2, bishop to b7, 95. Um, I think that here d5 got a lot of praise. Again, nowadays, there are, th this, this idea is very well known to play d5. And after knight takes, bishop takes, it becomes a real mess. Notice that you can just win a pawn because of that pin on the long diagonal. So d5, very sensible. All right, knight e5. Knight takes c3. Yeah, they mentioned that on d6, of course, I can just take on e4, and black is not ending happy. They are right about that. So takes. Bishop takes c3. This move, this, this analysis, I think I added by myself. Because I asked myself, why on earth don't they mention anything about this move? Is this losing? The answer is no. It's just a lot of compensation for black. Check, winning the pawn, and saving the knight, then taking here, hitting the queen. When the queen moves, knight c6. And of course, if you take on c6, if you take on a8, queen takes a8, well, that's really nice. So knight takes c6, and then maybe bishop a8. OK, compensation. Anyways. He didn't bother to test that. Bishop takes c3. Of course, it's just unnecessary to try it. I just thought it was working, but it's not. So bishop takes g2. King takes g2. So just like that, two sets of minor pieces have been traded. And I think that for now, white is doing quite all right. He is better developed. He has a little more space. His king is comfy, no less than blacks. Everything is cool. Queen c8. This move, for the life of me, I cannot understand. Maybe he wanted to go to b7. But I think it's really obvious that, this, that white is going to do something in the center way before the queen reaches b7. So where exactly is he going? Um, I think the computer was very much in favor of the move queen e8, trying to go this way. I think that makes more sense. So queen c8. And now notice the move, d5. The annotators give it a big exclamation mark. The computer says, nope, that's not the best move. <laughs> the computer says e4 is very strong. E4 is definitely, definitely, definitely the move in this position. And again, no time to do deep analysis. Believe me, if you want, when you go home, check it out. Remember my notes. You can see it on YouTube. Stop, pause it, and analyze. E4 is really a praiseable move. So D5, D6, Knight D3, E5. All right. So by this sequence, some of you might say, wait a minute. Why did white allow the closing of the position? Yes, he did, but notice that there are two beautiful squares here that will always haunt black to some degree. And for now, he's also a little behind in development. And now some strange moves have been played. First of all, white plays this move. That, to me, is kind of a lazy move. I don't think there's any amazing urgency to play it. Why didn't he play f4 immediately? I do not know. I think that it would just made sense to play e4 in this position. I mean, f4 in this position. But he didn't. He played here. And black played c6. Yeah, also they mentioned that at some point f4 is interesting. But all right, let's leave with c6, no problem. Now, knight, uh, queen b3, OK, a legitimate move. And now black plays, uh, returns the favor that white just gave him and plays king h8. Again, in my opinion, and in the computer's opinion, not a good move at all, just unnecessary. Much more logical was to close the position this way. And after here, 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 and white would maneuver knight. Very similar to the game, by the way. And it's OK. So after queen b3, king h8, just really not necessary. So f4, there is no way to defend the pawn on e5, which is attacked already three times. So e4, forced, knight b4. The idea is very simple. I want to play d takes c6. When your knight takes it, I want to hop with my knight to d5. If that happens and I end up with the knight on d5 with this weak pawn and this structure, that is going to be party time for me. So c5, hitting. 
And now the knight goes to c2. Of course, the knight wants to land on e3. I don't want to put a pawn on e3. I want to put a knight on e3. With, a, with this pawn here, I just weaken the square and my knight doesn't have a home. If I put my knight here, the pawn is just as blockaded and my knight is looking at all kinds of things. So, knight here, normal. Knight e3. And now bishop f6. Again, a move that goes kind of un, uncommented, but I think it's, it's very, very suspicious. And this is where, where the computer was really funny. Because initially, you think to yourself that everything is fine. The computer says this is OK. But when you let it churn for a little bit, then the continuation in the game kind of changes the assessment. So um, what should he have played? That's already difficult to suggest, but definitely not bishop f6. Um, maybe queen e8, again, would make some sense, I think. You know, even king g8 would have been better to play g6 at some moment. Would have been more logical, but just not bishop f6. Yes? Black doesn't look like he has weak dark squares or anything. Why is the move so bad? You will see. There's a promise for the, the, what happened in the game. So again, it looks like everything is okay, but now over he, pressure, he really appreciates the fact that uh, he can make a change in the position, a very dramatic change, sacrifice a piece for three pawns, and uh, the ensuing ending is going to be in his favor. Of course, not before Aliokin misses some counter chances. So, very strong, very, very good. Again, I, I'm positive that someone at the level of the world champion at the time w saw it. Unfortunately for him, he just under-evaluated it, missed something. We will never know. He's not with us to ask. Um, but when you see the continuation in the game, you start understanding that this is, uh, if only from, excuse me, a practical point of view, really not a good decision to enter something like this, because the burden of proof really will be on you. He tries to play aggressively. He tries to um, prove it wrong. but. The game makes it very difficult. So on we go. Knight takes f5. The only way to justify this is you have to be consistent. Bishop takes here. Knight takes d6. Now, you have to be able to attack the knight, because otherwise I just take on c3 and thank you for the two pawns. If you go to c7, I'm going to go knight b5. That's not fun. So it forces the next move, which is queen b8. And now knight takes e4. Bishop f6. Okay, already the computer is starting to be a little annoying with his nitpicking. He says bishop d4. Not exactly sure why. I tried to figure it out, but they didn't analyze this game for 10 hours, so I don't really know. Um, perhaps he wants to lure e3, but I don't think this really makes a big difference. So, bishop here. For sure, this move is excellent, and the reason is being shown by the arrows. Um, I have a very nice pawn phalanx in the center, c, d, e, f, and I want to just move it like a, like a fireball forward. So the knight has to move, and this is here. G5, a very aggressive move, but the computer is okay with it. He thinks that this is, yes? Um, instead of the immediate knight retreat, is there any, uh, yeah, maybe queen B5, just with the idea of like, kind of touch the knight, and then the queen's a little better place to assist the pawns as they start moving forward? Um, I'm willing to consider it, but I'm not sure that the queen is necessarily better. First of all, the knight can be easily protected, let's say queen c7. Yeah. But I'm not 100% that the queen on b5 is really safe, because I can always kick it. And you don't get to take the king either. And you'll, get to, you'll have to go backwards. Also, you'll notice that the queen has a vested interest to stay on the third rank because of chances to swing. All right, I'm just curious. Yeah, fair enough, a decent question. So, knight d2. G5, trying to create some mess. Of course, he is really praying in every language that he knows that maybe F takes G5 will happen. But needless to say that there's no chance in the world. I'm not giving you this square, not even for 10 times more than that. So on we go advancing. So he takes. Second prayer of the day, maybe the rook will take. No, <laughs> obviously not. Yeah, I mean, you, some people think, hey, maybe I'll take with the rook. I don't want to mess up my king side if I move with the G pawn. The king looks a little airy and drafty, but no, of course, like this. So f4, bishop to d4. Not sure that that was really necessary, but again, sitting and waiting is not a bad strategy, as you will see in a second. So here, e5. Very well. I have to tell you that when I saw this game, my first inclination is, listen, before it's going to be more expensive, 
Let me take the stupid pawn now. I, wanna, I, I don't care, take a piece, have a nice day, let me spring out of it because when I see this wedge right here, I'm starting to sweat all over. I mean, it's black. I don't care if they have an extra piece. Three of those pawns are for my piece. Materially, I'm not even up. And those pawns, well, you can just see what happened in the rest of the game, how far those pawns made it. The pawns made, made it far. So let me take now. Maybe I'll be down a pawn. I'll be suffering a little bit. But with this super unsafe king, maybe I have some chances. The computer agrees. But before I look at the computer, just the intuition is to take those pawns. The computer says, listen, take those pawns now. All right, he doesn't take the pawns. He plays queen e8. So there goes that idea. The pawns are not going to be capturable anymore. And nonetheless, what to do now? Because if you play knight f6 and I'm going to go knight f3, your proud bishop on the long diagonal is no, long, no more. You just took away his retreat if you play knight f6, bishop, d, bishop uh, knight f3. So Aljokin starts with his little shticks and he plays rook to g8. Very good. Definitely good. Especially in view of the idea that if e takes d7, queen e2, and all of a sudden white is going from happy to not so happy. So he played knight f3. Now, you see how the commentator says dubious? Well, I think the computer says strong, but OK. <laughs> um, very odd. The computer really likes this move. So queen g6, OK? And now, yeah, interesting would have been to play. Yeah, now, the, the, again, all those comments are becoming really, really weird. So knight g5, knight e5, counterplay. This, I think the computer says something like, you know, tenable, like really equal or something like that, really something ridiculous. So, but again, this is, this is going to take days to analyze. In the game, he went rook to g1, just investing more material. So takes, takes, and he played queen f6. Okay, notice that it says queen f6, mistake, and now white is winning. The computer says queen f5, queen f6, the same equal, the same value and equal. So I don't know who annotated this game, but may God be with him, okay? But um, queen f5 takes, takes, takes. And now the annotators say this, but the computer says queen takes f4 equal. Why equal? I don't know. Don't ask me. This is too messy. <laughs> this is really too messy. I'm showing you this for enjoyment, not for, not for deep study. This is really deep. So we are here. And queen f6, knight g5. OK, and now rook g7, I think was OK, but I'm not 100%. I don't remember all the analysis, OK, but I think that was all right. e takes d7, rook takes d7, queen e3, and rook e7 is good. So far, knight e6, rook f8. OK, there are a million possibilities. There's, other than the notes, there's like a million things. If we do that, we'll be here all night. Queen e5, queen takes, takes. Uh, now it says rook to e8, rook takes e6 is the best. The computer completely disagrees. The computer says um, rook f5 is fine. And now, here is where it gets really crazy. Now, the, you can see that rook g5 get an x clan. And then the, the line goes, rook takes, knight takes, blah, blah, blah. But after rook g5, rook f2 equal. The computer says. The, I trust the computer in that position, believe me. So in any event, the computer gives this dubious, the computer says best move. <laughs> so I mean, the annotator, the annotator says dubious, then yeah. So I mean, this is really funny, but it's really, really tough. That's a tough position to analyze. Much easier when you have stockfish next to you, you become a hero. So anybody that's mad about my teasing, sorry. Uh, but it's factual that people analyze it in a very funny way. So in this position, one thing everybody agrees with, that this was a blunder. This was a bad move. Um, taking now would not be ridiculous, would be very, very much counter chances. The other move was king g8, I think. OK, also was, was reasonable, if I remember correctly. But one thing for sure, the consensus is that this was the losing move. This is by far the losing move, because now the knight is starting to make crazy things. Knight d8. Well, I think everybody knows that taking on e5, not so good. Because at the end, knight f7 is going to be a fork. 
So right, if takes, 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 and then chuck, taking. So, rook f2, e6. Yep. Now it's very difficult. Now somehow he just doesn't manage to uh, coordinate, and the pawns are way too strong. So, rook d2, trying to stop d6. Knight here, attacking the rook. The rook goes here. If you move the rook away from the file, I'm just going to go e7, and I make a new queen. Anyways, e7, b5. Again, trying to generate counterplay, but you notice that now it's just completely, black is completely paralyzed. One rook has to be in touch with his pawn. The other rook has to stop the, the d6, d7 avalanche. But when you have two rooks staying behind one pawns, and I have more pieces, that is going to hurt. So b5, and he plays knight to d8. King g7. The idea was, of course, that if you take, I can play d6. And knight f7, and again, everything just works fine. Or knight f7, knight d6, also possible. Everything is just working. So he tried this. Knight here. Again, the knight insists on coming to d6. Check. Here. Here. Okay, and of course, you could have just taken immediately, and the computer says plus 5 or something. He tried check, but that was good enough. And in this position, Black resigned. So, okay, maybe I was a little harsh by saying that it wasn't the pearl and said some really mean word. But again, there's just a lot of mistakes, very, very much by the annotator. The game itself is not that bad. It's very exciting, again, when you have to play it, again, under all the pressure that I mentioned with no computers, then it's uh, definitely challenging. So, nice win for Max Over. All right, our next game is going to be uh, is described as Vasily Smyslov's immortal game. Okay, a little bombastic, but definitely one of his best games ever. This we can disagree. And this is with his match against uh, Mikhail Botvinnik in 1954. Again, the, much of the analysis now is based on Kasparov's annotations, unlike before. So, d4, knight f6, c4, g6, g3, bishop g7, not a surprise by any means. Both sides are playing stuff that they expected and everybody expected. Bishop g2, castles, knight c3, d6, knight f3, knight d7. Okay, a normal g3 fianchetto variation of the king's Indian. White is developing, controlling the center about the castle. Black needs to have his normal hit at the center, which will be e5. And there it is, e4 c6, everything normal. And now Kasparov mentioned some lines. He mentioned h3, queen b6, very similar to the game. So he played bishop e3 to take this thing out of queen b6. However, now a new move is possible for black, and he does it. Knight to g4, bishop g5. So this is all well known. The knight is attacking the bishop, but the bishop immediately creates some discombobulation here. And Normal here is, I think, f6, or bishop f6, also possible, but he plays queen b6. Okay, a very interesting game is now in front of us. Pawn h3. I don't have to tell you that if the knight goes back, then the black strategy is just bankrupt, completely bankrupt, because what was the pressure on the center if the knight now is going retreating? So he takes. Very good. This line lost a lot of popularity for white, by the way, in recent years. So, now, you don't want to play hg, B, d takes c3, and of course, black is nearly winning, with the bishop on the long diagonal, and the, the white pawn structure is just ruined. So, knight a4. At first, it may look like, whoa, maybe black blundered, because this knight that was attacked is moving, attacking the queen with a tempo, and now the, the knight on g4 is a gunner. However, black is going to regain his piece the following way, queen a6 takes b5. So the knight is trapped anyways. Again, this position is more or less equal, I suppose. You know, give or take again. And um, yeah, knight, we played knight d4. I think that the computer suggested something else. Maybe bishop f4 or something like that. Could be. Okay, so in any event, not so important because this is also pretty equal. Here and here. 
Until now, we, we had just a normal opening, more or less. This position is, is relatively well known. But now, Botvinnik plays a move that, in my opinion, is a little bit out of character. Because normally, he is the scientist, he is the methodical player, plays very calculatively. And here, he plays a little gamble. Uh, the move itself is not a horrible blunder, but it's definitely not the best move. He plays knight takes c6. OK, b3, defending the pawn on c4 would have been the sedated response, I suppose. But he decides, he calculated, decides to go for it. And watch what happened. This is where Smyslov really shows amazing understanding. So, of course, he takes. If you don't take, then you are really in trouble. Takes e5. Queen takes c4. Bishop takes a8. That was the idea, sacrificing an exchange. White wants to win an exchange. Knight takes e5. All right. So this is the deal that he made. He won the rook on a8. In return, black has lots of activity. And again, the pawn on g4 looks like a gunner. He's, black is going to get that. So materially speaking, he's going to be OK. And now the question is, what's going to be more significant? The rooks, that definitely don't have shortage of open files, or the pieces. Also, black's pawn structure is kind of funny. And watch what happened in this game. So now, queen d6, the computer says also queen d6 is OK. And you can take on g4. I think after queen d6, the computer even says bishop e6. Just not rushing to take the pawn on g4. Maybe the knight will take it. And again, black is doing all right. But he played rook c1 and queen b4. Queen b5, again, the annotations here, I'm not 100%. I think that the computer is just not as, agreeab as agreeable. But all right, queen b4, a3, and takes. All right, queen takes a4. You can see that white managed to trade the b pawn for the black a pawn. And again, until now, you think to yourself, OK, what is so amazing about this game? Everything is under control. But again, the evaluation is probably the most accurate thing, the most important thing. You'll notice that here, Botvinnik went to this thinking that he's going to be really OK. And Smyslov just proves him completely wrong. Bishop b7. And now comes the move that makes the game exciting. Because if he would have played in this position, bishop takes b7, queen takes b7, um, and then let's say rook c3. Just saying, listen, dude, I'm going to give you the exchange. Leave me alone. I'm going to have bishops ending. And you pawn structure, I'm going to get the a pawn. Probably I can get the d pawn if I play bishop e7. And things are going to be all right. Just the game would not be exciting whatsoever. Probably it will go towards a draw. But Botvinnik becomes greedy with rook b1. And rook b1, in my opinion, is not a good move. Not just in my opinion, in Kasparov's opinion, in the computer's opinion. And now what to do? It looks really gloomy at first, because we are forking, skewering, I should say, the queen and the bishop on b7. The rook is protected. You know, Let's start with the fact that white is up an exchange to begin with. So what to do? Well, Smyslov just starts playing Pac-Man with the white pieces. First of all, he plays knight f3 check, forking everything. King h1, the only move that doesn't run into captures with check. Now he took the bishop. Rook takes b2, he won the queen. Knight takes g5. King moves, ready to play f4, I guess. So knight f3, back you go. And back you go, you don't want to, because you go right into the discovery of knight d2 at some point. Bishop takes b2. So we have this unique position where black has three minor pieces for the queen. And this is always a question. What is better, the pieces or the queen? In this case, I think that the pieces are better, even though the queen is quite active and will take the pawn on a7, and the pawn on a will start moving a little bit. But still, I think that. This game really demonstrates why minor pieces are better than a queen. And that is really a nice display. Right now, you look at the position and you think it's hard to assess, right? It's not fair if you say, oh, black is better, because um, there's complete disharmony among the pieces. Sure, the bishop on a8 is defending the knight on f3. The knight on f3 is sitting pretty. But other than that, the rook is on f8. The bishop is on b2. 
we don't see anything concentrated. And white indeed takes the pawn on a7, like I promised. But now, from this position, if you etch it in your mind, watch how black, it's almost on, like only black was playing. That's the impression that you get, and this is very impressive. So, bishop e4. a4. Well, black was threatening, among other things, rook a8, and the pawn on a3 just dies, and then there's really no counterplay or any hope. So a4, king g7. Again, just in case the rook is going to move, and it will move away from f8 to more activity, we don't want to have a surprise where you get like a check and then the bishop falls, you know, some accident like that. This is again a Karpovian, typically Karpovian move, the king is away from danger. So, rook to d1, bishop e5, the bishop goes back to civilization, queen e7, rook to c8, so you're noticing that all the black pieces are starting to have some really real say in the position. a5, white's only ace. What else does he have? An attack on the king he won't have. Sacrificing on d6 is just clearly not enough. You know, just going to have a material advantage for black. So he tries a5. Rook c2. Almost as if saying, you know, your a-pawn is really not none of my concern. So, king g2. A very sad necessity. Of course, if I'm going to get to take the pawn on f2, you're going to have mates from every direction. I'm going to be threatening mate on h2 and knight g5 star. It's just going to be horrendous. So, king goes back into discovery. And the good news is that the knight has nothing to take. You just can't really kill with this knight. So the knight just adjusts himself to here. King here. Bishop f3. It's almost like a symphony. All the black pieces from... They were like in the diaspora, and somehow they're all coming to one promised land and become very, very annoying. So, rook b1. Okay, and in this position, he played knight c6, and I think that here Botvinnik resigned, because, well, he is not moving anything, and I'm about to go bishop d4, and things are just depressing. So, they say if this, bishop d4, queen takes d6, check, here, check, here, rook h2. And if to quote the movie that was mentioned before, taken, good luck. <laughs> yes, really good luck. Rook h1 is not looking good. Yeah, so resignation was inevitable. Again, I think that telling that this saying that this is an immortal game by Smyslov is a bit extreme because he did get three pieces for the queen. He didn't just sack a queen for two pieces or something that would really blow our mind. But again, the way, this, the way that he managed to get his miners from nowhere right into a big attack against the king, completely hopeless. White's A-pawn never had any chances. All right. Out we go from this game and on to the next one. And here we have uh, a very impressive game from a very impressive match in, in Russia, 1985. And between the two uh, well, perennial uh, opponents, Anatoly Karpov, who was a world champion for 10 years until he met Kasparov. And in this match, of course, he lost the title. If you remember, if I remember correctly, I think he lost game 24. But this is game 16 also, if I remember correctly, but I don't see it written here. I'm pretty certain that this is game 16 and probably Kasparov's best game of the match. Again, let's look at what happened with Black. He played a really beautiful game. So in that match, they had this variation many times arguing about that specific Sicilian line, knight b5, d6, c4. So we have some sort of a Marozzi bind kind of structure with the pawns. Of course, there are many, many ways to play uh, here. You can play knight c3, queen c7. It's just the normal time enough. But this was the discussion here, 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 here. And Kasparov played the very, very rambunctious d5. If you don't play that, then the game goes into normal lines. Karp this is going to be just in Karpov's, typically to Karpov's uh, liking. Bishop here, bishop here, castles, knight c2, just maneuvering, completely holding off d5 and b5. So Kasparov says, okay, you played all this, c4 and knight c3, even willing to put your knight somewhere in Honolulu there, just so to stop d5. And guess what? There it is for you. Yes? Has time proven uh, that to be a good move? No. No, I don't, but don't ask me for the reputation. No, I, I was trying to think about it today when I was preparing the lecture, but I figured it's going to take me like three hours to, to, to tell. 
Of course, I could have been more efficient by asking one of my theoretician friends who probably could give me the answer like this, but I can't say that I have. What's worse, Block here gets an advantage, I don't even know how. So I mean, this is just, but just great activity. So of course, the, to prove the gambit wrong, you must accept it. And he does. And now he just wants to give the pawn back, knowing that with a bishop on f3 on the long diagonal, it's going to be pretty good. So Kasparov says, yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm not interested in the pawn just yet. Bishop c5, castles, castles, bishop f3. I think that here, what was the move the computer gave? But I think it was also played at some point. I think that one of the discussion was something with bishop e3, and then still Kasparov got a lot of pressure because even though it's a very impressive center, it's not really going anywhere. The dark squares are all his, and I'm not saying it's good for an advantage, but it's hard to do anything with white. But OK, bishop here. Oh, uh, probably another thing that I want to ask, because after this he played, OK, this is still OK. So bishop f3, bishop f5. Now you play this move, rook e8, and queen d2. But it would have been interesting maybe to play the move d6 at some moment, like maybe now. And open up the bishop, even if the pawn gets lost eventually. Anyway, he was about to lose it right here. So just to play d6 and try to keep him busy with the b pawn. So it seemed that the computer was in favor of just pitching that pawn right here. So bishop g5, rook e8, queen d2 b5, and this is not a good move for sure. Very, very atypical. I think, I mean, Karpa must have had a really, really bad day there. Because rook a d1 is not good. Um, even here, d6 seems like a very decent idea. Give that pawn away already, open up the bishop, get chances. Maybe at some point threaten knight d5 or capture an f6 and knight d5. And maybe you can create some balance where you will be all right. Um, in the game, he plays this innocent move, just protecting an extra pawn. And all of a sudden, Kasparov played his knight here. Not a very difficult move to see. Now, white is facing a plethora of, of, of headaches. Uh, the knight is a real pain. He's really cutting the board in half. Like, this is his border all of a sudden. He has a little wall that prevents him from advancing. I don't want to say anything about the move b4 that just prosaically will win a piece. So yeah, something has gone already wrong. This position is already definitely better for black. Pawn or no pawn, black has all the play. So yeah, when you have to start making moves like this, you know that something went bluey. So he went here, eight six, chasing the bishop away. The bishop maintains the pin. B4, attacking the knight. Knight a4, bishop d6. So. Again, we can see the complete harmony among the black pieces. Knight on d3 is like a true bone in the throat, really annoying, protected by the good bishop on f5. We have a bishop on d6 that serves many purposes, controls this square and this beautiful diagonal. And yeah, white has a pin. That's maybe the most joyous thing to write home about. But still, black is in complete control. Bishop g3, understandable. That diagonal is becoming very, very risky, very, very dangerous. So I think trying to trade pieces, especially when you're up a pawn, makes some sense. Rook c8, pawn to b3. Notice in this position, the prettiest picture here is notice the problem of, the both, of both knights, the one on a4 and the one on b1. Let's see how long before they moved. Have they moved until the end? I don't even think they, they moved ever. So pawn to g5, OK. Maybe not the best move according to the computer. The computer was really in favor of the move bishop e5. Just improving further, controlling more. And again, very, very delicate position. Note that this rook isn't moving. This bishop isn't really moving. Things are very tough, you know? Very, very tough position. So this was still not the end of the world, but bishop e5 was even stronger. Now, takes, takes, g3. Knight d7. Again, even though white is up a pawn, the pawn is not queening. And it feels like only black has a plan. He is maneuvering. In the meantime, the white knights are just in complete, just out. Bishop g2, in anticipation of the correct knight e5. So then queen f6. He's controlling everything. The whole center, the whole board, the two open files. 
just imagine how much space points is up if we start counting just endless. So A3, again, with a little prayer, maybe he's going to take, but of course that will never happen. That pawn on B4 is alone responsible, is responsible for the uh, crippling of this knight. So A5, takes, takes, didn't really change the picture, at least he got rid of his weak A pawn, that's okay. Queen A2, again, when you, are, when you are down to playing moves like this, you know the things are not happening. But again, it's hard to be creative. You can suggest all kinds of things, but again, I promise you the computer is already completely in Black's favor, and, and Kasparov would have also. So here, bishop g6, interesting. The computer was toying with the move that I didn't think about, because I was trying to think what will Black play here, try to guess the moves. I didn't guess bishop g6, but I think this is just Kasparov saying, listen, I can and therefore I do. My bishop is going to a protected square, my queen gains some more points of space and more exit points, but the computer really wanted to play the move knight e1. And, well, it's obviously why this move is good, because I just want to take this bishop. If I take this bishop, mine is really going to be annoying. So the problem is that if you even dream about taking and I trade, then rook c2, and the queen is, well, mated. <laughs> Yeah, not good. Everything is just not good. So I think Kasparov, I don't know if he saw it and he thought that, you know, it's fun to torture him, so why do this and finish the game? <laughs> so I don't know. But this is also not exactly a terrible move. So d6, desper obvious desperation. g4, step by step, methodically, almost like a hyena after his prey. He's just chasing him, closing the gap, and you can just feel it coming. Queen d2, king g7, no rush. f3. Okay, a nervous move, but what else to do? Black is about to play queen d4 anyways, and you're not moving anything. I mean, you are really not moving any pieces. Things are really not happening. Every piece is just, the bishop is really restricted, the rook on f1 isn't moving, the rook on d1 can't move, the knights can't move. It's like almost like a mini Zugzwang. So he tries to do this, so bye bye pawn, okay, having said A, let's say B, check, knight f6, the knight is now coming into the game, really tour de force by Kasparov, really, rook f4, knight e4, the finishing touch. Okay, resignation here would have been very, very gentlemanly and maybe the proper thing to do. In the game he played queen takes, knight f2 check, takes, bishop takes, and rook d2. So already we can see that, materially speaking, things are not happening. He is trying to get a third piece. He's going to get a third piece. And this is definitely a position that kind of uh, compares with the one I showed you before. It might be three pieces against the queen, but while before the pieces were a little bit in the diaspora and immediately gathered to cause damage, here we have Rufus and Doofus on the side, <laughs> and the bishop that just shoots in the air all the way to a, an empty diagonal. Not good. So, queen e3, rook takes here, and again Kasparov can play a lot of winning moves here, but he makes always the most this was his, his, his evil tendency, especially when he was at his peak. Always the strongest move, the, the, the hardest to, to really answer. Now rook takes queen, rook takes d1, bishop f1, rook takes e3, and the position crumbles. It's going to be two rooks against three pieces, where the three minor pieces just don't know, just you lose them. Everything is going, you're going to lose a knight or a bishop, you're going to lose everything. So, knight b2, queen f2. Beautiful. Just saying, okay, you want the rook on c1, it's yours. Rook e1 is coming with mate. Very aesthetic. Even the finish is just aesthetic to think who he's playing against. This is not a game in a simul against some random. He's playing Anatoly Karpov, the sitting world champion, and watch what he does. It's just incredible. Knight d2. And of course, now mate is coming. Takes, takes, check, resigns. Game over. After rook f1, or bishop f1, or knight f1, just takes, 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 mate. It's not every day that you see Anatoly Karpov falls like laundry in a game like this. Just 
completely gets trashed. Very, very impressive. Really, really impressive. One of Kasparov's best games. I think he said that this is one of his favorite games. For sure, the best game of the match. And again, after a game like this, you really, you just have to feel some feelings of grandeur because it's just like, almost like a conductor in an orchestra. I just made everything play like a symphony. Beautiful. All right, guys, that concludes my showing for today. Hope you enjoyed the lecture. See you next time.